Welcome back to Amatech Brookfield University and welcome to all our first time viewers. In this training module, we will learn what to consider when writing test methods. We'll take into consideration the experimental parameters that need to be established for accurate test results. Hi, I'm Mark Oholen from Amatech Brookfield. Let's get started. When creating a test method, there are several factors to take into consideration. First and foremost, follow the 3S rule. Always define the spring range, spindle, and speed used for the test. Next, the sample container size, container shape, and sample volume must be specified. Since a material's viscosity is sensitive to temperature, it's recommended that all tests be performed under controlled temperature conditions. Ambient temperature can vary by several degrees, which can affect your test results. When preparing a sample for testing, always have the spindle and guard leg in place so they will reach thermal equilibrium with the test material. Sample preparation is also key to achieving consistent test results. The length of the test should be defined as well as the data interval for recording results. One guideline for selecting a spindle and speed for a new material is to follow the inverse proportionality rule. The viscosity range that can be measured is inversely proportional to the spindle size and speed of rotation. In other words, thinner fluids will use larger spindles at faster RPMs, and thicker fluids will use smaller spindles at slower RPMs. This is because thinner fluids will not generate enough resistance for the spring to measure if a small spindle and low speed is used. Thicker materials will overrange an instrument if larger spindles and higher speeds are used. As mentioned earlier, sample preparation can affect your test results. Consider the history of the sample. How was it handled and prepared prior to testing? Non-Newtonian materials are sensitive to shear. If they are subjected to shear before testing, this can affect the test results. The test method should state whether there will be any mixing, rest time, stirring, or shaking of the sample before testing. The method should also state how the sample will be introduced to the test container. Is the sample poured, spooned, syringed, or introduced into the container by another method? How is the conditioning of the sample temperature achieved? Has the sample, spindle, and guard leg reached equilibrium with the test temperature? How the sample is handled prior to testing must be specified in the test method. Other factors to consider regarding sample history are whether the sample has been sheared in the past, the age of the sample on hand, and how the sample was stored prior to testing. These factors can affect the viscosity results as well. Time-dependent, hexatropic, and dilate materials are sensitive to prior history as well. The viscosity will be affected by length of time the sample was stored and whether it has undergone any shearing from mixing, stirring, or pouring prior to testing. Testing at a controlled temperature is recommended to avoid differences in the viscosity results that would be seen when the tests are performed at different temperatures. You should select a test temperature that you want to standardize for your method. Before the test, be sure to you have reached the equilibrium with the set temperature and that the spindle and guard leg if used are equilibrated with the sample. Using a temperature bath, thermocell, or other means of providing accurate temperature control is recommended. By reducing sample size using the UL adapter, small sample adapter, or thermocell, you can minimize equilibration time as compared to using a 600 ml beaker. If you will test at ambient conditions, set a temperature with as minimum a range as possible. Before making any measurements, be sure to level the instrument and then auto zero the viscometer by powering it up. Remove any spindle that may be attached before performing the auto zero. Once the auto zero is completed, note the percent torque. It should read 0.0% plus or minus 0.3%. You can now do a quick diagnostic to check the condition of the suspension by performing an oscillation check. Gently rotate the coupling nut 
while watching the percent torque on the display. If it begins to show negative readings, stop and rotate the coupling nut in the opposite direction. Rotate until you reach 20% torque and then release the coupling nut. The torque should return to 0.0, .0 plus or minus 0.3%. If the torque is higher than that, perform the test several more times to be sure you're getting a consistent result. If the torque is higher than 0.0, .0 .0 plus or minus 0.3%, it's recommended that you perform a calibration check to verify that the instrument is still performing accurately. Once this check is complete, you can prepare and position the sample under the instrument. Do not attach the spindle to the instrument first and lower it into the sample. This will trap air under the disc. Introduce the spindle to the sample at an angle so as not to trap under air under the disc. Once the spindle is in the sample, attach it to the instrument. To help define the rheological properties of your sample, it's best to perform a shear sweep, ramping up and then back down in speed. This will define your fluid's behavior. You will know if it is Newtonian or non-Newtonian. This test is performed by starting with a spindle and speed that results in low torque of just above 10% and then increasing the speed in steps until you reach about 90% torque. Then ramp back down using the ramp up speeds you previously selected. Four to five speeds are adequate for this test. You can plot the viscosity versus RPM to graph the rheogram. When you know the conditions that the sample will be exposed to when used, you can select shear rates that meet those conditions and determine their performance based on the viscosity under those conditions. This applies to product performance that can be interactive with the user, but to processes where mixing and pumping are critical factors for their production. So far, I hope you've gained an understanding of the testing parameters that need to be established for accurate test results. Next, we'll look at various viscosity measurement techniques, which we consider as the common test methods using controlled shear rate measurements. The first method is simply time to stop. A test is run for a fixed amount of time. At the end of time interval, data points taken. Time to torque is used more often for materials that thicken or cure rapidly. Once the fluid's resistance reaches a set torque level, the test is stopped and the time is noted. Thix index is not related to thixotropy or thixotropic behavior. It's a two-point test that measures viscosity at two shear rates a decade apart, which is useful to verify shear thickening, shear thinning, or Newtonian materials. A speed ramp or shear ramp provides more information regarding the rheological properties of the material being tested. The time stop method is run for a defined period at one speed and at a single temperature. There is a fixed data collection interval that is usually just the last data point at the end of the test. However, multiple data points can be taken during the test as well. The time to torque test uses a percent torque as an end condition. A target torque value is specified, the test is run, and a single speed in temperature. There should be data collection interval specified and elapsed time should be recorded. Turing products are usually measured with this method to verify the time at which the sample is no longer flowable. If they cure too rapidly, they may not have enough time to flow into a mold or be spread onto surfaces. A speed ramp measures viscosity at several speeds or shear rates. A starting speed is selected by choosing a spindle and speed combination that results in a torque value of over 10%. The end speed is determined by increasing the speed until 90% plus torque is achieved. These two speeds will bracket two to three more speeds that are added to the speed ramp. Once the highest speed is reached, a shear sweep can be performed by reversing the order of the speeds used in the ramp. A time interval of 30 seconds for each speed is typical with a single data point taken at the end of each speed. While performing a speed ramp test, a single temperature should be selected. If you're interested in performing a temperature profile of your material, Several speed ramps can be performed at increasing or decreasing temperatures. For each ramp, however, the temperature must not be changed. 
The results of the speed ramp or shear sweep can indicate the rheological properties of your material, such as pseudoplastic, hexatropic, or rheopectic behavior. Once a rheogram has defined your material's rheological behavior, a single point test can be created. These tests are quick and can be used for production control or QC tests. To minimize the number of methods needed for various materials, refer to the rheogram of each product. See if they share a common speed or shear rate that could be used for testing all the materials. Determine an elapsed time for the test and compare results, looking for differences either between different products or between different batches of the same product. A single shear rate or speed measurement is a simple test method. Single speed is run for a specific time, and one data point is taken at the end of the test. As previously discussed, it can be derived from a rheogram. The method must state the spindle, speed, and time before recording a data point. The temperature, container size, and spring range of the instrument must be stated in the method as well. This test is quick, but it does have its limitations. On the plus side, a single point test can be used as a standard QC or production control method. It is a quick test. It does not give any information on flow behavior at other shear rates. A two point test, referred to as a fixed index test, and not to be confused with the rheological property of fixotropy, is performed at two speeds a decade apart, such as 1 and 10 RPM. Dividing the low speed viscosity result by the high speed viscosity result equals the fixed index. This test gives some indication of flow behavior by defining Newtonian, pseudoblastic, or rheopectic behavior. The higher the value is above one, the more pseudoplastic the sample is. The values below one indicate rheopectic behavior. It's a two point test that requires an additional data point to be taken, doubling the test time. A three-point test can better define the flow curve of a product. There may be a sharp decrease in viscosity between the first two speeds and less decrease in viscosity between the second and third speed, indicating less sensitivity to shear at higher shear rates. Adding a third speed to this test results in a longer test time. A multi-point test will generate a flow curve over a wider range of shear rates, resulting in a broader scope of the material's behavior. When using spindles with known shear rate geometry, dynamic yield stress can also be extrapolated from the results. This test will usually be performed with four or five speeds, resulting in a longer test duration. Using a DV2T or DV-Next instrument, the test can be programmed to run automatically. You can also use RioCalKey software on a computer to write the test program and gather all the data for generating reports. The viscosity test report should include the viscometer model, the spindle number, and the speed or speeds used in the test. The container size, volume of sample, temperature, whether a guard leg was used, and the time of spindle rotation at each speed must also be stated in the report. Pertinent product information and sample name should be recorded. The percent torque is a good indicator of the instrument's accuracy and can be used to keep the instrument within the instrument's range of accuracy. The torque value should be recorded along with viscosity. Amatech Brookfield offers a guide called More Solutions to Sticky Problems. The guide goes into more detail in section six on the different types of test methods, including the single point viscosity test, the controlled shear rate ramp, the up-down shear rate ramp, a time sensitivity test, a temperature sensitivity test, temperature profiling with up-down shear rate ramp, static and dynamic yield testing, and product recovery testing. I hope this training module has helped you better understand common test methods using control shear rate measurements. In the next module, we will look at when and why to use Amatec Brookfield accessories. If you have any questions regarding this training module, call 508-946-6200 or visit brookfieldengineering.com. We will gladly answer any questions you may have.